Hello, everyone, and welcome to this IOCDF Faith and OCD Roundtable discussion on the Protestant Christian tradition. And we are just so excited to have so many awesome experts here, um, both in the area of the clinical side and also the pastoral side and lived experience. We just have so much to talk about today. And I would love to first give everyone a chance to introduce themselves and why they are passionate about this topic. But as you answer that, I would also love for you to share how we understand OCD within the Christian community or how we think the Christian community might understand OCD. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kick this off with Justin, if you can introduce yourself to us and then begin to speak to how we understand OCD in the Christian community. Absolutely. Thank you, Katie. So Justin Hughes, I'm a licensed professional counselor here in Dallas, Texas, and I specialize in OCD and anxiety disorders. And I love, love, love the work that I do. I, OCD is um, a core, just the main thing that I spend my time with. And I fell in love working with people who have OCD uh, because of the people, frankly, uh, some of the sweetest, kindest folks on the face of this planet. And uh, the treatments are really effective, really changed a lot of how I thought as a Christian, uh, things like OCD needed to be handled. So first of all, uh, from my perspective, uh, what is the Christian church's view on OCD? I think it's a bit broad and varied. It depends on denomination, church that you go into. Sometimes it uh, can be seen as something to be addressed by faith. Sometimes it's seen as, yeah, go go to your doctor, go to your therapist, psychologist, etc. There's just really a broad a base of perspectives. And while there, of course, are extremes with any particular perspective, I don't think that uh, from a doctrine standpoint, there are any extremes that are what we'd call orthodox doctrine, uh, aka at the bottom line base perspective of one way to see obsessions or compulsions and OCD. And we might talk about that a little bit more here today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Justin. Um, and I'm going to head over to Ted. Ted, I would love for you to introduce yourself to us and, and share a little bit about how you see OCD within the Christian community or how the Christian community might understand OCD. Sure. Um, my name is Ted Witzig, Jr. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist and a pastor. Um, and um, I really uh, like working with OCD in uh, people of the Christian uh, community because of the intersection of, of how uh, faith and OCD play uh, together or off of each other. OCD is pernicious and it, it accidentally um, can, uh, it, uh, can turn somebody's practice of their faith against themselves. And so, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the ongoing doubt, the intrusive thoughts, the, the rituals, and the desire for certainty. And I think to me, it's one of the biggest things about this that, that comes in is that OCD really pushes on that certainty button or the desire for certainty. And, and then what ends up happening is it ends up using the desire to get that certainty uh, to, uh, to push compulsions and to feed on itself. And unfortunately, then it has the potential to warp somebody's picture of God and to help them or to not help them to actually move them against actually what they believe and want to practice. And so I really see this as the opportunity to get uh, treatment for OCD is a, a, an, an opportunity to practice healthy faith and to grow. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Yes. Um, I am so glad you shared that. And that's a snippet I would love to cut out and share with so many people navigating OCD that treatment is an opportunity to grow in mm -hmm. faith and to connect with God. Definitely. And what a beautiful thing. Thank you. Valerie, I would love to have you introduce yourself to us and talk a little bit about how we understand OCD within the Christian community. Okay, hi, my name is Valerie Andrews. Um, I'm a lead advocate with the International OCD Foundation. Uh, and I come with, um, uh, I want to say 50 years experience as being a Christian. Uh, and for me, I think um, I really got involved uh, with OCD and faith for a lot of reasons because I was trying to balance the two 
communities that I both love. And I was struggling with understanding uh, what role I should play and how to intertwine the two. And I think for me, my experience has been that um, OCD is not always seen or recognized as other diseases uh, within the church. Uh, I remember I read this book once and it kind of had the light bulb just go off where uh, they said uh, mental illness or OCD is the non-casserole disease within the church body. And I found that to be true. You know, if you're pregnant, if you got a cold, you know, if you have cancer or heart disease, you know, everybody's uh, bringing you casseroles and, you know, building you up. But when it came to me, I'm still waiting on my casserole. You know, mm -hmm. it's better, but I was not seen on the same level uh, as all these other diseases. And I think until the church um, or even the, until both communities are able to treat it like we treat other diseases, we're going to have an issue. Uh, but I had to learn for myself that, um, you know, so often I felt it was a uh, related to sin or faith. But once I let all of that go and go, you know, I don't get to uh, pick the cross I get to bear, you know, that it's just a disease like any other disease, it was freeing. So mm -hmm. that's kind of where my passion lies, that both communities can come together and understand that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for mm -hmm. highlighting that for us, Val. And I know you've talked about that in different IOCDF events, and it always sticks out to me. It really does. And I, I watched everyone on here nodding when you talked about the non-casserole um, yeah. kind of experience. Thank yeah. you. Chris, would love to hear a little bit more about who you are and how you think we understand OCD within the Christian community. Sure thing, sure thing. Well, first, let me provide just a little bit of background on me. Uh, I come to this space as a pastor of 10 years, uh, minister for over 20, uh, with a lifelong uh, experience of lived experience with OCD, um, undiagnosed. Uh, until within the last five years, which is is pretty interesting because um, I was negotiating an OCD diagnosis as a pastor, uh, as a spiritual practitioner, and trying to figure out um, why am I afraid of my thoughts? Uh, and and when you know you you kind of dive into this this world of of mental and emotional wellness across the board. Uh, I think a lot of our congregations and our denominations could do uh, just a more effective job at, at giving space to it. I, I, I echo uh, Ms. Valerie's sentiments really <laughs> strongly. I, I'm still waiting on my casserole as well. Um, although I will say, I will say this, I'm, I'm quite fortunate. Um, the, the church I pastor, uh, I've been open and honest about uh, some of my journey and, and I've been supported really well. Uh, so I think the tide is changing, and I think a lot of that has to do with uh, settings like this, where practitioners and um, those from the medical side, those from the spiritual side, those from the lived experience position can have these honest conversations. And that's why I'm passionate about it. I really feel it's important uh, that we remove the stigma, uh, that we give people a space, space of grace uh, to, to be fully human. And in being fully human, that means we have some things uh, that might not be 100% perfect uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, uh, but there's also uh, a lot of beauty in that brokenness. And so having the opportunity to, to have those conversations in a, in a, a judgment-free, uh, non-stigmatized way is, is very important. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I am uh, passionate about uh, sharing uh, my experience as both a pastor and as a person living with OCD. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, and as folks can see watching, we have such just a wonderful group here that there are so many different overlaps between clinical and lived experience and pastoral experience. And um, would love to continue this conversation with something interdisciplinary and ask, how can we offer support for folks with OCD that honors both faith and mental health in an interdisciplinary way? How can these things work together? Um, and I'd love to start with you, Justin. 
Mm -hmm. So many incredible ways, as uh, Dr. Witzig was talking about uh, earlier, the intersectionality of OCD and faith is often very close and not just in the subtype of what we call scrupulosity, which are those overt thoughts, uh, obsessions about faith, morality, et cetera, but even just in the day to day. Uh, so we have scriptures that say, do whatever, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as a fun to the Lord and not for man. And so um, when Christians are seeking help and hope, um, so often there's, it's not just this an aside. I mean, for some people it can be, and that's not even a bad thing if a person just wants to get some tools of the trade and uh, be on their way. But so often for Christians, it's for us as Christians, it's so important that we're doing this deeper work of faith and trust in God. And so there's a lot of ways where this can can collaborate with clinicians, with clergy, with advocacy, uh, with, with others in the treatment world. And so speaking on the clinician side, I'm consistently regularly helping clients to navigate uh, this world. And as I was looking at what a wonderful panel we have, sometimes it can be discouraging to be on the suffering side or if you're not yet in the community to feel really alone. And yeah, you're, you're not going to find this group necessarily on every street corner. Uh, but at the same time, there are more, uh, so many folks, different places, ask, seek, knock. We, we have to, uh, to keep, uh, keep pressing into the fact that there in any mid size to larger church, there's several people that are suffering with OCD sure. and many who have some success, some success stories, um, many different people in ministry, uh, in clergy. Uh, and so oftentimes uh, going to a therapist's office, in some cases, a doctor's office becomes this first place where people come to terms with some of their symptoms. But the reality is that through, throughout history, the church has been one of those places where these things have first been noticed and, and caught, uh, where uh, clergy have been noticing these dynamics and not just responding with quick pat answers of just got to have more faith and trust. We can go back hundreds of years and see these in the writings of uh, Robert Burden, Richard Baxter, fill in the blank. And so I just I think that's maybe one of the biggest messages to consistently say that you're not alone, but also it's not just a few of us that are doing this and, oh, you got to see Ted because he's the big dog or uh, you got to talk to Dr. Reverend, go to, go to his church, uh, Dr. Reverend Chris, uh, for, uh, for spiritual growth when you struggle with OCD. No, God loves you. And he has provided a church and then also uh, in his grace allowed us to have treatments that are really, really effective. And so uh, there's not only one option, there are so many options to explore. It just takes a little conversation, a little outreach, a little reading. Thank you, Justin. I feel like Justin's, there. there is a whole sermon right there um, in terms <laughs> of how much we are are loved and, and held and, and surrounded by community. Um, and would love, Ted, to have you continue with this of how can we offer support that honors both faith and mental health? Yeah, I think one of the things that that for me, it comes back to how I believe God created us as human beings as being physical, emotional, uh, relational and spiritual. That can be broken up other ways, but I believe that OCD um, impacts us in those four areas as well, it, uh, physically, physically. Uh, it has impacts. We feel it uh, literally when we're, when somebody is is feeling the 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 off feeling of of OCD, and sometimes there's medication used psychologically, emotionally, how they see themselves, and and the thoughts and things that we fear. Socially, it can be so isolating. It can make us feel on the outside looking in or unworthy. And then spiritually, what is our my relationship with God? How does He see me? Uh, how does, can, can Jesus really love me? Those kind of things. And I think that it's important that, that we put treatment in all those different areas. And, and when I say treatment, I don't necessarily mean that it's always like some kind of, like I put my white coat on. I mean, some, sometimes it's, it is literally just having people to hear us, to walk with us, to remind us of the basics. 
I oftentimes walk with people and and they're they're trying to solve uh, in their head and because of OCD unsolvable things. Okay, things that the that the church and, and human beings have struggled with for for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and they're trying to get certainty on it. And and I think that's the beauty of faith here to be able to bring in a pastor. I love it when pastors come and sit in my office along with their family members, our family members or friends. I want people to travel with other people. I, I love to work with people on their thoughts and emotions and help them to understand OCD better and to work with physicians. And, and, and the concept is that as we work together, then what happens is that we can pace, pace this along in a way that, that in some ways, I have to remind people sometimes especially when they're when they come in and they're they're really really focused on trying to figure out their spirituality at a time that their ability to do so is really kind of wrapped around the axle okay. because of the how the OCDs and I have to just remind them of just just looking at Jesus as a gentle shepherd that knows his sheep and just a and and and, and OCD is such an accusing voice and such a, a and so is so brutalizing and then to be able to understand that that Jesus Jesus held the little children Jesus uh, brought the brought the sheep in close and so I just think that's a really important thing to be able to to help people to be able to see this whole treatment process in grace and truth. Absolutely, thank you, Todd. Thank you, Valerie. I'd love to give you a chance to continue this conversation on how we can honor both of these these disciplines. Uh, I totally agree with, with um, what has been said already. I know for me, um, from my perspective, I always felt for a long time that it felt like it was us versus them. Mm -hmm. You know, that um, people were struggling with the idea that, and I've actually been accused of uh, uh, outsourcing Jesus in place of, you know, therapy, which is not true. And, and also on the other end, I think, you know, therapists have to really understand that I'm a Christian, you know, that's who I am. And you're going to have to merge those two things together. So, uh, you know, when I start letting go of that us versus them feeling, which I think still exists so much as so many of our congregations, it helped. But bottom line for me, I always want to be known by my love, like mm -hmm. say, and not my judgment. And it was a place I had to get there because it's hard, like say when you're on the other side of it, uh, not to feel bitter, not to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, understand why people don't understand what's going on. So once I kind of got all of that together, and then for me, uh, I read something from Viola Davis in one of her books. And uh, I'm paraphrasing, but she talked about once you remove the stigma, you remove the shame, or the shame is easier. And then you can get to the root of we're just human beings, you know, that all of Jesus is trying to get to the same place. And when we can kind of see each other at that level and not, not so much in our titles, then we get a rid of, we get rid of that us versus them and it's more like uh, a partnership which you all kind of talked about and it helps us move forward in whatever way that might look but bottom line compassion kindness and knowledge goes a long way and for me like I said it starts with being known by my love and not my judgment mm -hmm. and judgment and opinions are two different things so I don't want people to think that, you know, because we blame each other so much, you know, we blame the church, we blame, you know, you know, the community. So uh, all of that has to kind of be worked at or looked at or open to uh, just listening to each other's side without thinking I agree or, you know, I'm being judgmental, all of those factors. Mm -hmm. So, and we're getting there. I agree, we're getting there. Thank you, Val. And thank you for being an example of someone who really is known by their love in this community. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Chris, would love to hear your thoughts on how we can offer support that honors both faith and mental health. 
So maybe about a year ago, I had a conversation, maybe about two years ago with a colleague, and we were just talking about mental and emotional wellness across the board. So whether or not one has a particular diagnosis, uh, whether or not one has struggled with episodes of anxiety, depression, what have you, um, the real challenge, and I say challenge in, in a positive sense, not as if it is difficult, but but what lies before us is to encourage and foster communities that value mental and emotional wellness, period, right? <laughs> like, like, you know, I, I think, you know, in so many ways, and again, going back to the whole issue of, of stigma, um, if, if we as clergy, and, and that's the perspective I'm speaking from, are, you know, as open as we can be, because you still are owed your privacy, let me be clear, but but as open as we can be around the importance of, hey, you know, you, you have these different dimensions of health that you need to address. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that that is a part of living a fully embodied life. <laughs> like, like, you know, we, 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 we don't often hopefully have uh, major medical episodes, but we certainly go for our annual checkup, right? Like those are things we do as a part of maintaining health. And so having, you know, more grace-filled conversations around, hey, you know, we, we, we have things that happen to us that impact our mental and emotional health. Some of that uh, showed up when we showed up on the planet, right? Some of that showed up as we lived our lives. Sometimes it presents in different ways and it's okay. And, and, and it's okay to value good mental and emotional hygiene just like we do in other areas of our health. Um, and I think that kind of takes it out of this separate space of being so different, if you will, from other dimensions of health. This, this is a health conversation. And, you know, as a faith community, you know, I think about it every time we have our different health awareness months. So when we have a particular cancer awareness month or hypertension awareness month or whatever, we, we have no hesitation, you know, encouraging people to make sure they are aware of their, 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 their status, that they go get uh, routine exams, those sorts of things. And so I think, you know, it, it's important to also honor this is just as much a part of your holistic health as these other dimensions. And uh, and again, doing that, I, I I love the language. Two two great two great metaphors I heard uh, from from Dr. Ted and from Miss Valerie that I'm putting in my back pocket. Uh, the 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 gracious holding of the children and sheep. Yes, like like yeah, and, and the whole piece of like yeah, like not not being judgmental in either direction. Like you know, it, it is important to understand that mental emotional health is a part of our holistic health. And our faith community, our lives of prayer, our, our love for one another can help us navigate some of that. But then there are times when we need people who have professional expertise to help us navigate that. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for echoing some of, of just the beautiful things that we've heard from our panelists today as well. And um, as we um, as we come to our last question, um, I, I I'm curious, um, one, in how you kind of address this, but also would love to give every person a chance to offer some words of hope with this for the community. So I want to ask everyone, how can individuals with OCD, clinicians, and faith leaders support one another in raising awareness for OCD and in destigmatizing OCD? But also as we think about faith leaders, as we think about clinicians, as we think about folks with OCD, do you have any words of hope that you would like to offer for all of these groups or for any of these groups um, from the spaces that you serve? And, and again, I'm, I'm so moved hearing from everyone here because there's so many overlaps between clinical, pastoral, lived experience, and um, just so curious where, where you all go with this. So love to start with Justin of, of how these groups can support one another, but also any closing words of hope today? Yes. Come as you are. Um, Jesus said, come and see. <laughs> uh, come as you are is a common theme. And it, reflecting on this uh, pastoral reference, Psalm 23, the shepherd with the sheep. 
uh, such a common reference in scriptures and that, that Jesus used. And he's come that we may have life and have it abundantly. And it's not in this just heady theological sense that I only have the right thoughts about things. It's the whole person. He's come that we may have life and have it abundantly. And so as the shepherd of the sheep, um, yes, so there may be various things that are, a person is called upon to, to do, a step of faith. Uh, but that can also look different from person to person. Uh, just our occupations are a great example of that. Uh, I wasn't called to do what Valerie does or even necessarily exactly what Ted does, or Katie or Chris or, or fill in the blank. And so just showing up, come as you are. And I understand that there's some natural nervousness, like, wait, wait, wait I, but I can't stay there. What's the next step? But the starting point is to come. And so, first of all, there are so many with these stories, so many with lived experience, so many who've uh, found freedom and recovery, and so many in ministry now that are having these conversations. And exactly right, this is a health conversation, uh, all in all. And it's a faith conversation, too. And so, if we come as we are to the Good Shepherd, I don't. I don't know if I'm going to go wrong with that. So I'm going to leave off with that. Thank you so much, Justin. And thank you for all of the amazing work that you do in this community. Thank you, Katie. Would love to go over to, to Ted. And I will say, Dr. Witzig is one of the first people that I even heard of talking about these conversations in the OCD community. And he's been doing this work for such a long time in impactful ways. So we'd love to hear from you how these different groups can support one another and any words of hope that you might have for the community. Sure, thank you. Um, a couple things. I think that it's really important for the different groups of individuals, OCD clinicians, faith leaders to understand that treatment can be done in a way that is sensitive to somebody's faith background. And this is really important because oftentimes when well-meaning clinicians who maybe, uh, maybe they haven't fully understood, or maybe they're not from the faith, a Christian faith background. Well, sometimes um, I will sometimes hear that someone's faith is being pitted against doing exposures. And there's no question that treatment will challenge you. <laughs> it will challenge you. It's, it's hard work. Um, but it can be done in a way that that is that honors uh, faith. And that is that is um, that I think that that by God's grace, we can push through. And there's actually uh, wonderful ways to do that. I think that sometimes that people and, and clinician or uh, pe uh, people with OCD and, and pastors will hear about some kind of a treatment and then it'll just like, it can kind of turn them off to it. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things is, I think that communication is such a big key. Mm -hmm. I, I also think that in this is that that we have to examine the role of uncertainty and what uncertainty means, because if if uncertainty, there's, there's I, I'm I'm bad at math, but I'll tell you a couple of equations that are really important, and that is that OCD wants it to go like this: uncertainty equals doubt, and doubt equals danger, and I I have to grab it, crush it, and kill it. Okay, unfortunately, that spins the OCD cycle. It puts gasoline back in its engine. And if we can turn it around to be able to faith that, or excuse me, that 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 uh, that uncertainty is uncomfortable, but it gives me an opportunity to move in the direction of my values, walking faith to move in that direction. That that uncertain, yeah, I, I don't like uncertainty any more than any of you do, but it gives me an opportunity to practice faith, and that God is faithful of that, and and that that can that can work. Lastly, and you can cut me out of this, uh, Katie. I'm going on too long, but I, I just want to say. No, one you're the saying other beautiful things, things. We're not going to cut you off. Keep going. <laughs> one of the other things is that I oftentimes, I, I think that treatment is becoming better all around for everybody with OCD. Um, but I think one of the things that I would say that faith leaders have a specific help that they can do is with helping work with the God image the picture that somebody has of God in this because OCD twists it so bad. So 
my work with people, I, yeah, I want them to, they'll look at medication and cognitive behavior therapy or exposure and act and social and, and spiritual things. But as part of that spiritual, we have to understand the God image. One of the things I use with that, with my Christian clients, is I, I show them oftentimes a picture of Jesus with a lamb. And uh, I have a, up on my wall, and it, it, Jesus' nail print is in the back of his hand. He's holding this lamb. And I say, what do you see? And they'll say, oh, it's Jesus with a lamb. And I'll say, I say this. Now, can you imagine yourself as that lamb? And I said, here's the thing. I'd like you to know that that picture represents Jesus holding you when you're having the worst of the thoughts, when the worst of the fear of the unpardonable sin and, and what if I've committed blasphemy, the intrusive thoughts, the sexual intrusive thoughts, the violent intrusive thoughts, and the, and the, the confusion that you feel, that, that, that Jesus holding that lamb close is, is, it may not feel less way, but this is the thing that I'm asking you to do and, and to rest in that as we go through treatment to treat those thoughts. So thank you. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Val, I would love to go over to you with this question of how these groups, folks with OCD, clinicians, faith leaders can support one another, but also any closing words of hope that you have. Yeah, it is funny because I was sitting up here thinking about the flock. <laughs> also, so I'm going to stay on that vein. Uh, yes, you know that... Um, we have to understand that we're all part of the flock, uh, you know, under the guidance of one shepherd and then, you know, our, our true shepherd, which is Jesus Christ. And I often thought about how uh, Jesus in his own walk went after that one lost one. And not to say that we're lost, but I look at it in terms of he went after that one that was struggling. And going back to what you said, you know, often times growing up as a child, we always see the picture of Jesus with the lamb on his shoulders. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, I felt like, okay, that's when he's carrying me. Yeah. I had a, a uh, Jesus moment. I want to say I was walking and uh, it was one of those bad days where, you know, you're crying and you're not and all that kind of stuff. And it was like, you know, uh, Jesus removed this from me. And I felt my spirit, he told me, no, my grace is sufficient. But he went on to say, how are you going to use this to glorify me? Mm. And so that's where I come in the picture of, uh, because I do see the church, uh, you know, being a Christian, you can't take that out of us. That's who I am. You know, yep. we know where our hope lies. But oftentimes, like we say, we need that additional uh, help, just like I wouldn't go to my therapist to be my spiritual leader. And so once I allowed myself to not feel that I was, you know, resourced in Jesus or that I was sinning and all of those things because I needed to seek outside help, the burden was just really, you know, lifted. And that's yeah. not to say I still don't struggle. I still have questions when it comes to faith. I think that will always, you know, be with us because, you know, we're Christians. But bottom line... Uh, I would like to say to all of us, especially as Christians, we know where our hope lies, you know, and it lies in him and it lies in what he gives us to move forward, such as uh, all of us on this panel. I'm thinking so much uh, as a person with OCD uh, from this group myself, you know, there's a lot of pearls, a lot of wisdom here. And I think once again, once we let go of that us versus them uh, do it this way and do it that way, we can kind of move and, and sit down at that table, you know, and keep the conversation going. Uh, final thing I would say for myself, I learned or God showed me, I would say that it's not my responsibility to keep the conversation going. It's our responsibility to start the conversation and then maybe minister it and help it along but that's going to have to be everybody else's um, responsibility. And we do that simply by not being afraid. Uh, and it goes with both communities, you know, not being afraid that we're so uh, super Christians that we don't understand each other. And then for us to feel that, you know, that uh, uh, 
uh, mental illness, we're, we're afraid to even say the words because of the connotation that has been, you know, the narrative all our lives. So once we get beyond those barriers, and I think uh, I'm just so encouraged by the panel, just from my perspective, because I'm not a pastor, you know, I'm just a person sitting in the pews with OCD trying to survive. So I get really encouraged when I see this, and uh, we know our work is not in vain. Mm -hmm. But bottom line, we're part of that flock, and we got to go get each other, however that might look. Thank you, Val. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, I will go to Reverend Dr. Chris McKee. Um, Chris, would you share with us how individuals with OCD clinicians and faith leaders might support one another? And of course, your words of hope for the community as well. Well, let me first say amen to everything that has already been said. I, I really don't have much to add. I, I have been thinking about uh, when John writes in the first epistle of John that um, there's no fear in love. And, you know, there's there's this place where I'm to, um, as a person, as a Christian, as a minister who happens to have this, this diagnosis, that we, we have to fearlessly and lovingly have courageous conversations uh, with one another, um, in our faith communities, um, with clinicians, uh, and, and give space just like this. I mean, I, I hate to be the person on the panel to say that, you know, we always say on the panel, you know, we need spaces just like this, but it's true, right? <laughs> like where, where we could kind of have this, this, this exchange of, you know, we, we all bring so much value to this conversation and we need each other in this conversation. And, you know, if, if there is any hope for, for folks like myself who have, um, you know, I, I know those of us who have lived experience, we have had some devastatingly grim moments. Mm -hmm. um, and I absolutely know without a shadow of a doubt, it has been a beautiful weaving of intense prayer <laughs> and a tool set, right? <laughs> a tool set of ways to actually deal with this disorder um, that, that has brought me through some of those moments that I, I, you know, honestly did not think I would come out of. And so I say all that to say, you know, being able to own that truth, own that story, speak that story, talk about it, uh, it, it's a powerful means of destigmatizing some of this. Yeah. Um, because I think, you know, Justin says something interesting that there's so many people in our pews that, that, that struggle in this way. And, you know, I, I remember, you know, and I'll share this, uh, I, I don't want to go over my time, but I remember having a conversation once with someone who was open about their OCD diagnosis. And what that said to me was like, wow, like, you know, if, if we're not courageous enough <laughs> and loving enough and truthful enough, mm -hmm. then how do others get an opportunity to feel like, you know, they're, they're not some uh, isolated uh, anomaly, right? <laughs> but they're, they're part of this community too. Um, and that, that's just important. And, and I think, you know, it's already been said, but I think it's worth repeating. Every opportunity we have to kind of break down this false barrier between, you know, science <laughs> and, and, and medical help and our faith, that, that just becomes another opportunity for us to understand how much we're in relationship with one another. Um, and that there that there is an opportunity for people to experience full lives. You know, I think the piece we miss is OCD wants to strip us of these full, beautiful lives that I believe mm -hmm. God wants us to have. And, and if we can begin to have those conversations, I think that helps us to understand, you know, what whatever tools, you know, whether they be medicinal, medicinal therapeutic. Uh, behavioral, whatever they are, 
um, that they, they can help us live these full lives that God wants us to live. And, and it can happen. And, you know, there are those of us who are living, breathing, walking examples of that. Um, so thank you for the space. Yes. Yeah. Real, real, real quickly, uh, Katie, can I uh, say something real quick? I wanted to say, too, when I was listening to uh, the pastor, uh, the verbiage, uh, because I so often refer to OCD, I have this disorder, but I love when you put it in the context of a diagnosis. And sometimes it's the little simple things yep. that can break, you know, that that um, stigma. And yep. I was just sitting here going, oh, I need to change my verbiage. Instead of saying a disorder is a diagnosis because people are more willing to accept that, especially within our church bodies, I think. So thank you for that. Thank you. You know, one of the things I think of, Valerie, is that uh, I think of uh, a lot of times when people are being hard on themselves about having uh, something, I'll, I'll say, you know, what if we would look at OCD as an affliction and how, how does throughout the scripture, how does God and how did Jesus look at people with affliction and how did he encourage us to treat it? And, and it's with compassion. And so and and uh, to be able to see that 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 affliction can actually be redeemed. I appreciate what all of you said about how how it's been hard, but it's also you've also come through and mm -hmm. and yeah. you're, it's, it's not it's we're not damaged goods. We're 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 offerings to be able to do good things. Yeah, and I tell my I tell my friends usually when it's in our suffering that we find ourselves able to run to him and be mm -hmm. under his wing, you know, and find our space, our love, our comfort with him. So there is a beauty in this brokenness, as you said, that we can even uh encourage ourselves in uh uh grow in our own faith during these times. Mm -hmm. So it's not always we see it as, you know, a negative, but it is also a time to grow, you know, mm -hmm. spiritually and as a Christian. But like mm -hmm. I said, I tell people, that's what I find myself really drawn to Jesus or, you know, seeking him. It's in the bad times because mm -hmm. the good times are good, you know, but it's the bad times. So I'm leaving this with so many uh, Sunday school lessons <laughs> from all this wisdom up here to teach. So. Well I'm so glad, and this is hopefully our first of many faith and OCD roundtables in this way. But thank you all so much for highlighting for the community the ways that we can find beauty in the brokenness. Um, just such a beautiful thing. And I hope that everyone watching, um, you are able to take in the compassion also that Ted was just talking about and see yourself through the same loving eyes through which God sees you as you walk on this journey. Um, and I hope that everyone knows that you are you are not alone and that there is hope. And if you are watching this and want additional resources, you, of course, can head over to the IOCDF Faith and OCD resource page. We would love to have you at any of the Faith and OCD conferences. And we are just so glad to be in community with you. So thank you for tuning in today. And we look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>